Beautiful day outside, or a little actually a little overcast right now, but getting close to 60 degrees. I hope everybody is healthy and safe. We're back here with the Beck Bodie and Boss Retirement Advisors next webinar. And to use a uh, favorite saying of uh, our co hosts and my co managing partner, Jim Bodie, G Wiz has a lot happened over the past few months. It's amazing. To me, I'm sure many of you feel the same way that these last two months or so have felt more like two years. Uh, for a good part of this, we've been um, socially distancing and staying at home and fighting the good fight. And um, just a lot of information and, and everything to digest worldwide over these last few months. And I can speak for us and our team, as you've heard in these last few webinars that we've been doing since I believe the first one was March 13th, where you, uh, we covered a number of questions in uh, subsequent webinars. You met a number of members of our team, um, including some information on our uh, directors of financial planning, as well as our investment committee. We just recently had our um, regular investment committee meeting this morning where we talked uh, about a lot of things and digesting a lot of the information that's coming in. If anybody, if you get the Wall Street Journal here, you see on the, on the front page, if you can see it, you know, a lot of talk about how many jobless claims uh, have been filed. Um, yet the markets, uh, for the most part, particularly since uh, the beginning of April, and certainly into May here uh, have been on an uptrend. Um, I think digesting and baking in a lot of information about um, certainly where we've been, but also looking forward and as we start certain areas of the country uh, starting to open up and uh, thoughtfully so in a lot of ways where you know, in the state of Massachusetts here in particular, uh, phasing in um, certain entrances or, or, or back, to, back to business in certain phases. And so like there was over the past few months, there, there was a lot of information to digest on the fly. We anticipate, you know, the future as we always do is gonna be different from today. And I don't mean that in a bad way, but both uh, uh, in a good way. And, and uh, I'm sure as we have been throughout history, be surprised by certain things that happen. Uh, but we'll continue to move forward um, and we'll continue as a firm um, outside of what we do on a daily basis to, to hopefully provide you some great content for consideration and uh, direction. And uh, certainly today's guest, which I'm going to hand over to Jim in a second here, uh, certainly fits the bill. Um, so I just wanted to say a quick hello and uh, wanted to pass it over to my uh, partner, Jim Bodie. Thanks, Ben. Hi, everybody. Um, today's guest is Andy Robertson. He is a social security expert. He's the president and founder of Capital Identity Group. Um, he has written extensively about social security and currently trains, including has trained a lot of our staff within our office, um, financial advisors across the country on the topic. Um, I have known Andy for a number of years. He's been in the industry uh, for 20, 30 years, uh, really since his days at Northeastern, where he was a fellow uh, Northeastern football player. Um, I think I did receive more honors than Andy, but uh, we won't get into that right now. Um, but uh, the idea that we're going to have today is, is we're going to talk about some of the, the, the common questions that we're getting regarding Social Security, um, not just in today's environment, really, really how to plan around it. Uh, at the bottom of the screen, as always, if you have specific questions that you want answered, uh, you can type it into the chat. And I will say that a lot of time, uh, social security planning and, and helping clients uh, choose the right option is very personal. So we might answer some of those questions on, on, on another phone call in the future. But we're going to jump right in. Um, Andy, are you there? You might have to unmute yourself. I'm here, Jim. I'm just trying All to right. pick myself up off the floor after you ran me over. Thanks, uh, <laughs> thanks for those, those great comments. Never felt more welcome on a call than I have now. <laughs> you shouldn't uh, be surprised. You should not be surprised. 
But I think no. the best the best way about going forward with this is why don't I read off some questions that we're sure. getting that you're getting, um, and we'll jump right into it. Are you good with that? I am. Perfect. So in in no particular order, I have a list of about five different commonly asked questions here. Um, and number one is starting is is I think a pretty common one is I've paid into Social Security for so long for all of my working years. Um, shouldn't I take the benefit as early as possible? How, how, how do you address that question? Well, I think, I think, you know, from all the conversations we've had, it's really hard to give a canned answer to that question. The answer really is it depends, you know, on the situation. So I'm not a, you know, I'm not a huge advocate for somebody taking benefits early, but it's particularly challenging if they're going to continue working. So a lot of people over the years have had that, you know, sentiment that you have where it's mine, I paid in, I'm going to take early. I don't know if I'll be here. I don't know if Social Security will be here. So I'm going to take benefits and I'm going to invest my money that I collect from Social Security and build a secondary savings account that if I'm still here at 70, that secondary savings account will have provided the same level of, of additional income that Social Security would have provided had I waited. I think that's the balancing act that people go through. And like so many things in financial planning, that sounds good in theory, but in practice that very rarely works out because if you take benefits as early as possible, 62, and you keep working, you're actually going to be uh, facing the earnings test. And I would venture to guess that for most of your clients, that means they'll actually not receive a benefit. So the earnings test will wipe out in 2020 Every for every two dollars you're over the threshold, eighteen thousand two forty is the threshold this year. For every two dollars you're over, you forfeit a dollar in benefits. And and just to be clear, what they mean by forfeit is you don't get a check. So there's a lot of confusion about what happens if if I end up, you know, facing the earnings test. And the simple answer is, if you owe a dollar as a result of the earnings test, you're not getting a check in January. And if you owe more than the check is worth, then you won't get one in in February and so on and so forth. So for a lot of your clients, I'm guessing if they took benefits early in the end, they probably wouldn't, if they kept working, they wouldn't receive a check anyway. So, so taking early sounds good in theory, but the amount of value you get for waiting from an economic perspective is really um, much more valuable than any kind of a, what I'll call a break even analysis would account for. So I can go on and on on this stuff, Jim. So you just have to, you have to cut me <laughs> off. I know you've got more than one question. So. No, uh, I, I mean you kind of led into you. You kind of led into the next one is is about waiting, and it will be a larger Social Security check. Um, can you talk about some of the benefits of waiting um, and breaking even over the years? Sure. So, well, a couple of things. So, most folks who are you know on the doorstep of retirement, they recognize that if their full retirement age is age sixty six, and they opt to take benefits early, say as early as possible, sixty two then they're gonna incur a 25% reduction for life. They also know if they opt not to take benefits at 62 and wait till full retirement age. And then at full retirement age, say, full retirement age say, well, you know what, I don't need it now either. I'll wait till 70. They know that through delayed retirement credits, they'll get 32% more at 70 than they would have gotten at 66. What a lot of people don't realize when you do the math is that the difference between what you collect at 62 and what you're guaranteed to receive if you wait until 70 is 76%. So you're guaranteed a minimum increase of 76%. And then the additional benefit that you may miss out on if you collect early is whether you're collecting benefits or not, once you reach that first year of eligibility, age 62, if a cost of living adjustment is declared, your primary insurance amount, which is your retirement income benefit at full retirement age is actually adjusted accordingly. And that can happen every time on a compounded basis that a cost of living adjustment is declared during that time frame. So, so to give you some perspective, Jim, uh, let's say you turned 70 in 2019 and you opted not to take benefits eight years prior. You knew eight years prior when you made that decision, you were going to get at least 76% more. What you actually are going to receive at 70 now is 104% more. So, so to give you some perspective, if you were able to take that, mo that money early at 62, you didn't suffer the effects of the earnings test, 
you had the intestinal fortitude to save every check, you didn't owe taxes, and you grew that secondary retirement savings. In order to match what Social Security is, is guaranteeing you, the 76% increase, you'd have to earn 16% per year on that money. Because you don't get that money in a lump sum check, you get it over 96 months in equal payments. So of course, if you need 16% on that money that you've saved, and on a 76% increase, well, obviously you need an even larger return on a 104% increase. So, so what do you gain from, from waiting? A couple of things. You gain more guaranteed income for the balance of your life and the life of your surviving spouse because the higher of the two benefits continues for the surviving spouse. The other piece that a lot of people don't realize is Social Security is, is uniquely um, positioned to provide tax efficient income because it falls under provisional income. So the more heavily weighted an overall retirement income plan is in social security income versus fully taxable distributions from an IRA, the more tax efficient that becomes. I think that's particularly important to think about right now, knowing that if nothing changes in 2025, we're gonna have a tax increase. And that clearly given what's going on today, you know, we're digging ourselves into an even deeper hole. So, so I think it would be a little bit um, unrealistic to go into the next 25, 30, or 35 years, assuming that I'll never experience a tax increase as a retiree, knowing the fiscal challenges we face today. So, so tax efficiency is a big one. The survivor benefit is another. And, and ultimately, in the end, you're really shifting the burden over time on the Social Security and off the capital, which the retirement capital, which you know, allows folks like you and Ben to do an even more effective job in preserving, maintaining, and even growing that asset while the client is actually drawing income. So obviously, we all would love to have our cake and eat it too. You know, we're eating it when we're taking distributions for income. You know, how can we preserve it at the same time? Well, the more we have, ultimately, over time, the greater likelihood that, that we can pass on the cake as well. And Social Security will allow you to do that. You may have to use more of your assets on the front end, but on the back end, 25 or 30 remaining years, when Social Security is doing the bulk of the, the lifting, it's a game changer, as you know, for your client. Yeah, that, no, I, 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 a couple of numbers jumped out that I just want to get a little bit more of an explanation on. And the first one is waiting from the age of 62 up until the age of 70 the income that a client receives on an annual basis will be 104% higher. So, so it's guaranteed to be 76% higher. And in the instance of the time frame we just had, the, the eight years prior to 2020, because of COLAs, it actually worked out to be 104. So okay, the prior, so, so, yeah, go ahead, Jim. So when we break it down, we're including on there the, the, the cost of living adjustment that Social Security has, plus the guaranteed increases that you're going to get while you wait. Precisely. And that came up with 104%. And then you mentioned a second number. And this goes into another question that, that you've kind of skirted over here a couple of times is taking the benefit at age 62, not necessarily needing the money, but investing the money. And you mentioned the term, the number 16%. Mm -hmm. what, what are you referring to with that number? So, you know, the num it's just numbers, right? So regardless of what your Social Security benefit amount is, in order for you to match the 76% increase you know you would get if you opted not to take benefits at 62 and waited all the way till 70, in order to match that increase by using a secondary pile of cash. So in essence, opt in to take the benefit at 62 at the 25% reduction, saving every one of those checks for 96 months. What would the value of that capital have to be to match that 76% increase? You know, I use, I use safe withdrawal rates. I think it's good, credible science on which to kind of premise the answer to that question. And the answer is I'd need to grow that money year over year, over eight years to the tune of 16% like clockwork to match the 76% right. increase. I know I'm guaranteed to get if I don't take benefits at 62. So, so when you're trying to weigh the option of not taking and taking, you know, the, the issue is, well, if I took it, I saved it, and I invested it, how much would my investment advisor have to deliver in a compounding of growth rate to match the 76% increase? 
and the on the money I receive, it would be 16% per year. Unbelievable. Now, one of the questions that just came in is, can, instead of staying at 62, what if we did it at full retirement age versus age 70? Do you know that information off the top of your head? Yeah, so the increase is 32%. You know, what would you have to earn on your money? I could guesstimate it's it's going to be more than the market has historically delivered. You know, you guys do a great job managing money, and I don't say that to patronize you. You guys know that I work with a lot of advisors, but uh, I even refer my own my own family and friends to you, you and Ben. But but even you guys would have a tough time, you know, delivering the kind of performance right. that Social Security would requ would require to match Social Security. So so I, I think the simple answer is it's probably an unattainable number somewhere north of, you know, probably 12 or 14%. And again, you have to get it like clockwork, right? So if God forbid yep. there's any volatility during that time, then you have no shot at all. But, but I think the issue people are typically trying to weigh, Jim, is, well, if I take it early versus waiting, you know, I have this whole break-even issue I'm trying to contend with. Right, and I get that. But the issue with break-even is if you're going to continue working and take early, you're not going to get four years worth of benefits anyway because of the earnings test. So you're probably... Mm -hmm. In, in your own kind of yellow pad work as a potential retiree, you're probably overstating the amount of capital you're going to get your hands on. And as a result, overstating how long it'll take to break even, it shrinks dramatically when you realize you're probably not going to get four years of checks if you file early and keep working. Right. Makes perfect sense. Um, one of our one of our last few questions, because we're coming up on the hour here, is is in, in your opinion, when we look when you look at all of the, the different benefits and claiming strategies, is there anything that you say is still the best kept secret about social security that people should know about? Well, for me, it's the tax efficiency for sure. And the ability to, to manage that unknown in the future. Again, I think, you know, you, you and Ben certainly know that the biggest challenge with retirement income planning isn't, you know, inflation, it isn't taxes, it's the compounding effect that inflation and taxes have over time. And when you're talking about a longevity of 20, 25, or 30 years, the ability to shift the burden of combating inflation on the Social Security and reduce taxes because of provisional income can have a real meaningful impact on your ability to preserve that capital, which I think in the end is what everybody wants. So I guess it's really the two things combined is, is ultimately the ability that Social Security can provide in, in protecting the, the retirement assets against the incredibly erosive effects of longevity inflation. It's totally overlooked. It cannot be accounted for in a break-even analysis. And, and I'll leave you with this on this topic, Jim. Right now, the vast majority of widows in this country live in poverty. And the reason they live in poverty is because they're out of money, because they took Social Security benefits early. So they had to self-fund a disproportionate amount of their income early and over time, so the assets evaporated, and all they're left with is the higher of the two Social Security benefits that remains, but that benefit, because they took it early, was permanently reduced to begin with. So it's unfortunate, but if I could parade, you know, 100 widows into a room and ask them if they'd do anything differently, I think they would all say, yeah, if I knew then what I know now, I would have listened to Jim and Ben and done things differently if they were my financial advisor. So, so I don't, I don't think, you know, the impact is immediate. I think over time, what it does is that you build better, you know, more effective, more successful retirement income plans for your clients and do a better job preserving that capital for the next generation. Yeah, I, I, I would say that probably 90% of the clients that, that we're working with, we're doing planning for in, in retirement and social security is definitely one of the, the biggest confusions out there. And a lot of times for this is they're getting advice from a whole bunch of different people. And then right. they end up on uh, Social Security Administration and they're sitting down or now having a conversation probably similar to this, getting what they think is their best options. W what do you think about going to Social Security Administration? Should you lean more on them versus a planner? What's, what's the best strategy for a client or someone to help make those decisions? Yeah, great question. Well, the first thing is around about 2004, the Social Security Administration made a decision that they were gonna forbid their claims representatives from providing advice because retirement had become far more complex, right? So, you know, 35 years ago, there were really two parts to the retirement income planning process. There was social security and a defined benefit pension plan, and that was it. Today, as you guys well know, people are coming to you and they've got a bunch of stuff, you know, they've accumulated over the course of 
their careers at different organizations and their own independent savings and that kind of thing. And Social Security recognized that their people just weren't equipped to really give the kind of advice it required to understand not only how to integrate all those pieces, but how to harvest them most efficiently for the client. So that's the first thing. Social Security is not a place you want to go for advice. They're forbidden from giving advice. That doesn't mean you won't come across somebody who won't tell you their opinion. They will, and they do, and we have some that work for us, and they don't understand financial planning. So they really, it's really important that everybody understand that that's an opinion that they're providing. It's not relative to your situation. And I would say the same thing about anyone else. Everybody has an opinion about what you should do with Social Security and retirement income planning, but no two situations are exactly alike. So unless the person you're talking to knows exactly what your situation is, and if you're like most people, you're not telling your friends and family all of your secrets, right? They're not really in a position to give you advice. Their situation is, you know, likely totally different than yours. And then lastly, who should you turn to? Well, our firm, as you know, certifies financial advisors in the Social Security retirement income planning process, the certified Social Security claiming strategies. If you're not talking to somebody who's been through you know, the course that your team has been through, and, and a quick plug here for our team, but we're talking about a 14-chapter, 200-page textbook that you have to master on top of everything else that you do. If you're not talking with somebody who's certified in Social Security claiming strategies, you're not talking to somebody who's really equipped to give you the right advice. And I'll say this, you know, a lot of people you'll meet will have financial plans. And financial plans, in my experience, are designed to take you to retirement. But there's a big difference between a financial plan and a retirement income plan. A retirement income plan is, is meant to take you through retirement. And only people who are qualified should really build those plans. They're far more complex. It's kind of like your physical health. You need a specialist in, in retirement for your financial health, just like you need a specialist for your physical health. Things are far more complex the older we get. And it's important they seek out someone like you guys. No, yeah, 100% accurate right there, Andy. Um, Here's, here's my last and final question. Sure. And when I sit down with clients or when I sit down with prospective clients to talk about income planning and Social Security, the number one question that I am continuing to get, especially over the last few, the last few months, is what is your thoughts in particular on the longevity of Social Security that it is going to be around to pay out income for generations to come? Yeah, that's a great question. Again, you know, it, it does come up a lot. I mean, I'm having discussions every day on this topic. So here's the good news. Um, you know, I'm an advocate for people understanding completely the role that Social Security can play in the planning process and ultimately preserving capital, which I think is, is the end game for all of us. It's a, it's a challenge because, you know, it's very complex and it takes the right kind of financial advisor to embrace it and understand it. The vast majority of Americans still to this day, in spite of, you know, our best abilities and others' best abilities to educate them, continue to take benefits early, not at the mm -hmm. optimal time. So the irony in all this is COVID-19 is certainly going to have some people pull the trigger earlier than they would have maybe because they're displaced. And it seems like it's going to put more pressure on the system. But the reality is all the forecasts that the system generates year over year assume that people take benefits early anyway. So right. will it have an impact? I'm sure it'll have an impact. You know, whether or not Social Security has to reconfigure, you know, the percentage of benefits it's able to pay is in the third month of 2034 or the sixth month, I think, you know, is really what we're talking about at this point. But if you're retiring today, you know, the Social Security issue that people are concerned about is not yours. It's the next generations. It's the people who are going to retire in 2034, they're the ones who are facing the possibility that they only may get 74% of what they were forecasted to receive. That's not this generation. And I don't know what it's like for your clients, but for a lot of the clients that the advisors I work with um, talk to, they can't have a meaningful retirement planning discussion without assuming Social Security is going to be there. So, mm -hmm. so I think, number one, we have to assume it's going to be there. Number two, what I would say to you is, as, as painful as this time is, it really, you can only drive people's behaviors down to the age of 62, right? You still can't take it any earlier. And they will already, the vast majority, about 73 quarters are taking it early as it is, in spite of what, you know, um, what we would suggest in most cases. And right. 
ultimately, you know, what I push back on all the time is in 2008, we are in certain, we learned certain financial institutions were really so important to the monetary system that they were too big to fail. Well, let's not forget that Social Security is a primary income source for 76 million boomers. And if we were to pull the rug out from everybody, from under everybody overnight, you know, you talk about a total economic collapse. It's just, the reality is it's just not an option. I think, as you know, I've told you this many times, I think Social Security has historically been a political football. And I think as we get closer and closer to 2034, there are some simple fixes that will be undertaken to protect the next generation. But this generation doesn't have to worry. And the reality is we're not talking about a system that's going to be out of money till sometime 2075. And um, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but my guess is most of us, at least who were at the doorstep of retirement, 2075 is a little out of reach. So, so <laughs> we're going to leave this for the next generation if we don't do anything differently. But I, but I think the time will come. And when they do, it'll be to fortify Social Security, not take it away. We cannot afford economically to, to eliminate that purchasing power in this economy. No, absolutely. No, I really appreciate it, Andy. Um, we're coming up on the hour. We're on the hour here. So we're going to wrap it up. Um, but I'm going to hand it back over to Ben. And as a follow-up, as always, if you have specific questions, you can email us. You can schedule an appointment with us. Uh, we're here to help. Ben? Thanks, Jim. Really appreciate it, Andy. I, I think just one, one thing that stood out to me is your distinction between financial planning and retirement planning. That's really powerful. Um, you're right. We've been through your training. We've heard you present numerous times. And that always stands out to me as a, as a really big distinction because it's, it's really, really important to have that understanding of how the different factors impact certainly the folks that don't have that income stream coming in from when they were working. And that's really, really important to have the understanding of all those factors. So really appreciate your time today and your thoughts and really appreciate all of the attendees spending uh, about a half hour of your time with us today. Uh, enjoy the rest of the day. Enjoy the rest of the weekend. And we'll uh, look forward to seeing you uh, on our next webinar. Thank you. Great. Thanks, fellas. Have a great weekend. You too.